coming. Uh, my name is uh, Avi Kiviti. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, my previous project, uh, KVM, uh, which I was uh, the maintainer for the last uh, for seven years. Uh, but now I'm uh, doing a new project, uh, OSV, uh, which Gaber and I will uh, present. And for those of you who doesn't know me, or and for those that do, I'm Glauber, so working together with Avion OSV, and previously working on the past few years with containers. Uh, so I'll let Avi start. Okay, thanks. Uh, so this is uh, the team that is uh, doing uh, OSV at uh, Claudius. I have a full head in real life. <laughs> well, that can change. <laughs> um, and it's completely it? frozen oh, there. Oh, there it is okay that's that's not expected but the first one was fine yeah okay so this is going to be a little awkward but probably uh, the resolution difference i don't know yeah we'll manage okay so let's look at the uh, wait let's wait for the slide to come up is there any other PDF viewer that I might have in Fedora? I don't know. Okay. Uh, so let's look at the story so far in, in uh, operating system uh, evolution. First, people coded directly to the hardware. There was no operating systems uh, back in the good old days. Uh, but then they found out there was a lot of uh, common code to application and common tasks they needed to perform. So people wrote operating systems for, for those uh, things. And then with uh, bigger machines, they wanted to run multiple systems multiple instances on a single piece of hardware, especially with uh, the mainframe. So they invented hypervisors way back in the 70s. Uh, and again, applications still had a lot of uh, common code, uh, and so they abstracted that into runtimes. Uh, a good example of a uh, managed runtime is the Java Virtual Machine, the JVM, uh, and also things like application servers. So there is a pattern here where uh, people keep adding more and more layers in order to abstract common functionality. And this is how it looks like. The hardware, on top of that, almost always to date, these days it's very prevalent, a hypervisor in, in clouds. Uh, then you have the operating system uh, presenting an API. And more often than not, there is some runtime, the JVM running on top of that, and then the application server and the app. And then we have to switch uh, to a slide and it takes five minutes. No, this one is fast. No, it doesn't move. I mean, the previous one. Yes. And it's also cut here. So I'm sorry about that. <coughs> Maybe if you take it out of presentation mode, it's going to get better. Yeah. Maybe. OK, so uh, let's focus on three of the layers in, in the stack the hypervisors, the OS, and the JVM. And what we see is that uh, uh, they all have some duplicate functionality. So each of them is trying uh, to protect the layer below it from the layer above it. Uh, from example, the hypervisor uh, uh, protects the, uh, the hardware from uh, and abstracts the hardware from the operating system, and it presents a unified set of hardware in KVM that's uh, Virio Block and Virio Net. Uh, the operating system does the same thing. It abstracts the, the uh, hardware via device drivers and presents it as uh, files or processes. Uh, and the JVM, again, does the same thing. It takes uh, the various um, uh, operating system APIs and abstracts again, them again into the JVM uh, APIs, which are then used by the application. Uh, and the same thing happens in reverse, uh, where you have uh, um, uh, protection uh, each layer does uh, uh, the protection, and this is all uh, duplicated, and we all know what duplication means. It means uh, enlarged footprint and inefficiency and more things to manage. Uh, so that would be all be okay, as Avi said, if it came for free. And uh, what we can realize, I mean, when we look at the job that the operating system is doing, so here you can be more or less uh, what kind of tasks each of those layers are doing. Uh, turns out that the, historically speaking, the operating system is not really good at isolation. Uh, it can isolate processes 
well enough in terms of security, in terms of accesses to resources, but when it boils down to actual uh, the multiplexing the resources in terms of resource usage, uh, it doesn't go that well. So has, there has been attempts in the Linux kernel to change that through C groups and the whole container thing, which was uh, what I was working on. Uh, but the historical fact that virtualization, uh, that the operating system is traditionally not very good with isolating things, is that what led to the wide adoption of hypervisors. Uh, so that's one of the reasons. So if, if you look at how things are, it makes sense for like for back, back then in the day when it had like VMware start uh, getting v virtualization to get serious. Uh, that is in the x86 market. I mean, virtualization itself was invented by Ramses II, already working for IBM to build the pyramids. Uh, but uh, if you look at the x86 world, it comes with VMware pretty much. And what you get is that you get a virtual server. So if you're going to isolate a workload, uh, then each virt virtual machine uh, isolates whatever is inside the virtual machine pretty well. When we have the cloud, things change even further because now there is another pressure, uh, which is uh, pretty much the flexibility that you want from cloud deployments. So we get Amazon, for example, which is an extremely large cloud provider, and they're not even talking about machines anymore. They're talking about the compute node. So you just have something that compute, uh, and it's getting more and more commoditized. You just get on uh, some of those compute nodes, and when you need them, you bring them. When you don't need them, you send them back. And things are, have, been truly, have been turning truly, truly massive. Uh, your workload is usually not entirely tied together, so for maximum flexibility, uh, so this is the kind of things you have in cloud. I mean, a bunch of buzzwords, but it's basically uh, many kinds of way, many types of way in which you can deploy things in the cloud. But traditionally speaking, you, uh, there is an extra pressure to have things completely isolated. So uh, you don't really want many applications running on the same virtual machine, uh, because aside from the fact that the operating system inside won't isolate them that well, uh, you have... Uh, you would like your workload to scale independently. So if one part of that scales, the other one not, does not necessarily so. So you just bring up a machine. And really, if you look at how those things are being deployed, uh, you really have commodity tiles being deployed. So you don't really think anymore. Uh, people don't really update their softwares in their virtual machines. So the OS is basically immutable. Uh, if, you if you want to run a new version of the operating system, uh, you basically spin out a new VM. Uh, and it's very important from my point of view to point out that this is not really a proposal that we're making. Uh, we're not coming here to say this is how people should run cloud and VMs. This is pretty much, a, we look into the cloud and we look at the Amazon workloads, for example, uh, how, did, how they're doing their deployments, and that is how it is working. So not only there is duplication and functionality, that, but that duplication is pretty much useless. You're not using all that isolation. Uh, when you go look at uh, how does the typical virtual server looks like in the cloud, so you have the traditional cloud infrastructure, and each of those virtual machines, they run uh, a virtual server, uh, Linux most of the time. Uh, Linux supports, uh, it's a multi-user operating system, but most of the time you're not using it because of things are isolated uh, among VMs. Uh, you can run many applications, but turns out that in practice you're usually running uh, just one of them. And uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, so you get a lot of complexity for no reason. So the whole idea that we get for OSV is that uh, we should really try to diminish this uh, complexity by making things behave in a way that is more natural given the boundaries that we have today. So we truly believe that less is more. And that's why we're not giving shirts this year, but we're having uh, boxer shorts for you, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> because less is more. So uh, during the talk or even after the talk, come talk to us and collect your boxer shorts. And don't forget, less is more. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, uh, so what are we trying to do? We are trying to uh, build the very best operating system for running uh, cloud workloads. Um, and that means the easiest to manage, providing the best performance, being the best uh, overall. And I'd like to just say, it's not, uh, uh, if we, all, we are often asked, is it a new distribution of Linux? Is it a modification of Linux? No, this is something that is written from scratch, um, something that we've written at uh, Cloudius and are now open sourcing. Um, it's completely new. 
so let's look at how uh, OSV is built. So this is basically a, a, a core, a, a, a sort of kernel that runs in the same address space as the application. It runs just one application, so there is just one process instead of a, a, a wide range of processes which have to be managed and switched around. Uh, there is no concept of user space and kernel space. There is just one, one space, so there are no privilege level transitions which, are, which cost time and also uh, require validation of parameters. So that's on what we change. What we don't change are the APIs that, that the application sees. So there is no need to port your application uh, to OSV. It will just work, but it will be faster and it will be easier to manage. Um, so these are some of the changes that um, uh, we are making. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, memory, we're using uh, huge pages to reduce the uh, uh, memory access uh, latency. Uh, we have sharing between the JVM heap and the system memory so that you don't need to configure each of them separately, but it dynamically changes according to uh, requirements. Uh, we have improvements to I.O., and since we're in a single uh, address space, that's very easy to do. Uh, we, we are making scheduling improvements. The operating system knows that it is running on virtual hardware, and it is optimized to run on, on top of a hypervisor. Uh, so we, we use this knowledge uh, to improve the scheduling algorithms. Uh, since it's uh, smaller and simpler, then it's already uh, tuned for the cloud workloads. There are no thousands of uh, configuration files and knobs that you have to twiddle to get the exact performance. It, it, it comes pre-tuned. And we're also doing uh, improved communication between, uh, between threads. Uh, so if you look at that, uh, we're very, very confident that by writing it from scratch, I mean, we, we can get things done better because we have design decisions that uh, a traditional operating system that runs many kinds of things cannot take, uh, and we do because we're basically writing everything over. Uh, the very fact that we have pretty much no drivers help us out with this task because there is no 10,000 network cars to support. There is only Zen, KVM, VMware, pretty much. And there is very unlikely that we're going to have 10 hypervisors in the very future. I mean, we can have an extra one, who knows, but not too many. Uh, so we, right now, up to now, I've told you things that we've been doing that everybody does, and, and we believe we do better due to the decisions we made. But there are also nice opportunities to be done uh, once you get rid of the user space, kernel space separation. I'm going to detail some of them now. Uh, so when you get a network package, for example, what you get, as you can see here, is packet processing is quite serial in, in the way it, it behaves. So you get an interrupt coming, and it tells you that a package is available. So while an interrupt handler, you allocate a, a SK uh, buff, for example, in the Linux world, and then you keep processing that until it finally gets in the application. And uh, one of the reasons it is like this is that somewhere there, like you have a very clear kernel user space boundary that we do not have. Uh, if you look at the, and this is the traditional socket model, right? If you look at Van Jacobson's proposal, uh, you cannot see all of it, but most of it, it's well enough to understand. Uh, Van Jacobson has been speaking about that since 2006, and that's not something that is impossible to do with Linux. It's something that is more natural to do with our model. Uh, which he calls network channels. So instead of sockets, uh, we're moving towards network channels. So what network channels does is that in interrupt handling, you actually don't do anything. You don't even allocate memory. You just get the package and relay to the correct location. So whatever the network car put, the package is fine. And then you process that very, very close to the application. So you're already processing this. So first of all, outside interrupt context, and also in the same CPU, in the same cache line, very, very close to where the data is going to be consumed. Uh, the results are actually quite good. Those are not our results. Those are experimental results from uh, Von Jacobson on Linux. So it's actually very easy to do that in Linux experimentally, but in practice, it is a little bit harder. You need somehow to get your a network stock uh, running in the same context as your application to get it as close as possible. So one way of doing this is to moving more of the stack into user space, but the other way of doing this is what we're doing, move more, mo I mean, move the application into kernel space. But what matters is once you're out of the boundary, we can, try, we can do those kind of things. Uh, 
Also, as Avi, uh, Avi said, but I'm going to detail uh, Java machine virtual, the Java virtual machine memory ballooning. So if you're familiar with the ballooning drivers in KVM, for example, that's pretty much the same thing. People who run the JVM usually have to statically set the size of the heap and say, yeah, you need to know in advance how, mon how much memory you believe you're going to need. And what we do is that we just allocate all the memory to the Java virtual machine, and we have a balloon driver inside. This is still actually work in progress, but uh, it's uh, currently being done. So it's not for the future or mid-future. Uh, when, when you need memory, that balloon drivers get memory back to you, and when the Java virtual machines need that memory back, instead of garbage collection, for example, we can try to ask the operating system first, can you give me back some of that memory? So it's the traditional ballooning driver, same thing between the gap uh, between guest and host, and this is also made not only possible but a lot easier by the fact that you have no trust issues here. So the operating system and the Java virtual machine are actually all operating in tandem. There, there is no nothing to protect against. Okay, let's look at the timeline of what we've uh, accomplished since we, we started. We started around uh, December and uh, quite quickly we have uh, uh, Java Hello World running. Uh, we have uh, SMP support uh, quite soon after that. Uh, and then we enabled the various features, uh, support for networking and storage. Uh, we're using a ZFS as our, as our file system, and we uh, gradually optimize the networking stack to get uh, really good performance. And we're now running real-world applications like uh, Cassandra and Memcached, and we're getting uh, very good results out of both of them. Um, and we're very happy with where we are, and we're now continuing this, uh, optimizing more, enabling more functionality, and uh, testing more applications. Uh, part of uh, the reason we've been able to uh, proceed so quickly, uh, first of all, it's a smaller application domain. It's, we're not trying to do every possible workload like Linux does. We're focusing on a smaller set of workloads. And the other reason is we're using modern techniques. For example, we're using the C++ language as our implementation language and not C, which reduces the amount of uh, coding we have to do. We're able to reuse more libraries, more data structures, uh, and this way it, it reduces our uh, development and debugging uh, overhead. So the status right now, uh, we're running Java, but not only Java code, pretty much any JVM-based language, uh, like uh, Ruby, which runs on, on the JRuby project, uh, and the newer, cooler languages like uh, Scala, Groovy, Clojure, they all run on, uh, uh, on OSV. Uh, in addition, we also run uh, selected C applications. We are not supporting the entire POSIX API, so we can't just run any C application. Uh, but we do support a large enough subset that important uh, applications can be ported with relative ease to uh, OSV, and we run uh, memcached, and others is also possible. Uh, in certain benchmarks, we, we already get very good results. Uh, so right now, it's not uh, uh, tremendously better than uh, Linux, but they are sufficiently better to show the promise, and we plan to improve it uh, even further. Uh, in microbenchmarks, it's very easy to show the potential uh, because you have things like uh, context switch, which are uh, relatively expensive on Linux. They run very, very fast on OSV. Um, boot time, which is particularly important in the cloud because you, you scale by uh, spinning up new instances on demand, so boot time is very short, which allows it to respond very quickly uh, to uh, uh, loads that become greater and, and lower in time. And what is time? <laughs> uh, it's around the same thing. Um, of course, course, you can just you pull the plug. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, we're, we're using the ZFS file system, which is a, a great choice for the cloud because it's uh, self-healing, so it, it reduces the administration overhead. Uh, and like we mentioned before, we're using uh, huge pages. So uh, why is the OSV open source? So first of all, we all, we all come from an open source background and we love open source, but it's more than that. Today, uh, to be credible in the infrastructure space, you have to be open source. Otherwise, no one is uh, looking at you. And we're looking for a cooperation. We're looking for uh, developers who are interested in the kernel space, in doing an <coughs> operating system from scratch, uh, we're looking for people who are interested in uh, a management stack for this uh, operating system and people who know the DevOps work workflow, how you can deploy your application dynamically, uh, push a new version every day or sometimes even multiple times per day. Uh, and we, we would love to cooperate with uh, the open source community on that. We already have multiple con contributors to OSV, 
including from uh, two companies and also individuals. We have a very friendly uh, BSD style license and no contributor license agreement, so just sign off and, and that's it. Uh, and we really would love to cooperate with people. In terms of uh, architecture ports, so we started with the x86, of course. We were only 64 bits and no 32-bit port. Out of familiarity, with, uh, we started with uh, KVM, and it's running very fast on that. There is also a, a, a Zen port that runs on uh, um, Amazon, and you can uh, use, uh, use our image on Amazon, and it, it just works. It's still not as fast as uh, it could be. We're still optimizing it, uh, but it, it does run. And we plan to do a VMware port uh, eventually for the enterprise, um, enterprise customers who are mostly on VMware. Uh, we also uh, want to do an ARM port, since ARM is such a hot topic in, um, uh, in virtualization and in data centers. And if you have uh, another architecture that you want to see supported, then patches are very welcome. All right, so this is what we do. Uh, not, of, not everything that we told you is completely ready, but it's everything at least a work in progress. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit more about things that we plan to do uh, that shows the potential that we have. So those, those are all still ideas, but, but uh, th th those are ideas that make sense and they're actually implemented in other scenarios, in other circumstances that we just believe we're, we're actually capable of implementing them uh, in a nice and supportable fashion. Uh, most of them revolve around uh, changing the JVM somehow. Uh, so this is one of the main differences that I see particularly between what we're doing and the containers approach is that uh, we now have your application having access to all the facilities of the hardware. Because, I mean, KVM or Zen or whatever, the hypervisor is protecting you, uh, your application, uh, the JVM in that case. And it is the JVM only to provide a single entry point, so you don't have to change your application and every, every change is behind it. But uh, the JVM now can see the hardware. You can see everything. And there are many interesting things that can span out of it. Uh, the one I'm going to detail is this. I mean, garbage collection is by far one of the most annoying things of the Java world. I mean, is it, it's nice when you code, but it's not really nice when it just stops your machine to garbage collect and you can't really do anything. Uh, one of the techniques that the Java virtual machine already employs is to keep a dirty bitmap of, uh, or any kind of dirty tracking, really, uh, to know if a particular region of memory has changed since the last garbage collection run. And if it hasn't changed, there is no reason to go through it again. You can just reuse information from the previous run. Now, the JVM does that, but he spends a lot of time by tracking those, those memory because it needs to be tracked in, in the just-in-time compiler uh, level. I mean, it, every memory access needs to be audited for that. Uh, but it doesn't have to be this way if we give JVM uh, access to the page tables. So if you can use the hardware dirty bits, for example, uh, whenever you have a change, you're just going to see that uh, represented in the dirty bits by the hardware. So you don't really need to do anything in software. We can proceed a lot, a lot faster in that. So it's in this case, it's not really only the garbage collection that goes faster, but the, the whole execution can actually proceed faster. Okay, let's... Uh do a little technical deep dive into some of the features of OSV. Um, so the first feature is not really a feature, but it's a, an attribute of how we develop it. And it's using C++ uh, for a kernel, which is uh, pretty rare. Uh, but let's look at uh, two pieces of code. Uh, on the left side, we have a typical uh, kernel code that uh, locks a particular data structure with uh, two locks that are nested and uh, does some operation and has a few checks. And uh, as most kernel developers will be familiar with, there is a lot of uh, uh, code that checks for errors and does the uh, appropriate rollbacks. And it becomes very complicated and very long. Uh, so this is very typical code. And on the right side, uh, you can see how it transformed when you use uh, a scope locking. Uh, you no longer do need to do all those rollbacks manually, and all the uh, error handling. Uh, it just works. Uh, you want to uh, return something, then you return uh, the value. Uh, and the, the language already takes care of uh, unlocking everything in the correct order and at the correct place. Uh, something else we do is uh, we, ha we have a strong focus on uh, performance and tracing. Uh, so the code here shows how you can declare with just one line uh, a trace point. Uh, and then use it in just one other line. And uh, on the screenshot below, we have uh, 
uh, an OSV shell command that allows you to uh, enable trace points dynamically. Uh, so usually a trace point is compiled to a single NOP instruction, uh, but when you uh, enable it, it compiles to code that uh, dumps all the parameters to, to a, pr a log file or is able to, um, uh, to a statistics counter. And we can count statistics or generate call stacks, and then we can use that to analyze application performance and understand it and all of that without changing the code, since those trace points are um, placed statically in into the system. Another feature, this is a more advanced feature, which will be uh, a little in the future, are data plane applications. Uh, so a certain class of application has uh, performance requirements that are very high, uh, and uh, they don't want to go through the entire stack. So for these kind of application, we enable direct access uh, to the virtual ring buffer. And there's an application can sit up on top of the ring and just consume packets as they come in, uh, do the transformations you need to do, and send output data very, very quickly. And this way you can obtain very high performance and, and very low latency. Of course, these are applications that need to be written specifically for that API, but uh, there are some classes of applications that will benefit greatly from it. Now, OSV can save a lot of resources, as we've told you. Like, uh, we believe we're faster, uh, we're more performant in many ways, uh, and we're reducing duplication. But CPU and memory are not, only, are not the only expensive resources you have in your organization. I mean, another very expensive resource are people. Uh, it's not that we want to fire people, uh, we want to give people vacations. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, you're, you, what you typically have is that it's not that uh, we're proposing to get rid of people. I mean, it's, it's in the same thing. It's, about, it's all about duplication. So when you, when you look at the whole stack, you have someone managing the hypervisor to, to offer you some cloud offering of any kind. Uh, but once you run your application, which is your domain, the thing you understand about, uh, you also need someone to manage all those operating system instances. Uh, and that's a sysadmin, and it's not that sysadmins in general should not exist, it's that that sysadmin is misplaced. I mean, he, sh he shouldn't be there. It's just, it's just cost. Uh, there are, if, if you look at what people are doing in the cloud today, there are, you always have an operating system as your guest, so you need to configure your operating system, you need to set up the users, you need to set up the configuration file, you need to tune it to the particular uh, use case that you have. Uh, all of that needs to be done. It's either done manually by a human being, uh, or it's, tried, it's automated away, but even this automated away process is error prone, and it's particularly, uh, it's tricky because if you make an error in the automation, of course, you're just going to replicate that. Uh, so automating away the problem, uh, it's a way of looking into this. So the OSV way is slightly different. Is instead of automating away, it's you just get rid of the problem completely. So uh, there is no tuning to be done. There is no tuning to be done. Like as Avi said, uh, we only doing one thing. So we run virtual machines and only one application. There is no choose between workloads. That's your workload and end of story. There is no state to be saved. I mean, there, there is no configuration files. There is no way to do that. Uh, you basically, you need a new VM, you come up with a new VM and you're good to go. There is no patching. I mean, there is, is especially patching. I mean, of course, we can release new versions, but there is, uh, we're not uh, doing something which you're you going to try to update your operating system. Uh, in particular, if, if you're using uh, any kind of Linux distribution for that, you have unrelated packages that are just there because the system needs it to, to run, and it, you need to update them eventually. You need to follow the security advisors and all that. We are all doing a single binary thing, uh, and again, it's, it, we just expect that to be a lot easier from the management point of view, the actual management of the runtime of the virtual machine during the lifetime. Uh, we do have management software, uh, so we have a REST API, and uh, the, you can connect uh, either shell or SSH or a web browser, is that the example we're showing, which is basically aimed at uh, deploying things at, at our OSV. So we, 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 it's in our interest to make this as easy as possible. You basically, if you have a Java application, for example, you drop the jar in there and you're good to go. Uh, it's basically a way to install things. Uh, you, you get things installed in OSV, and once you prepare the image, there is no maintenance to be done. That's the goal. So, uh, and again, I mean, we're aiming this to be completely stateless, and this is, this is something that fits the cloud model very, very well. 
Uh, you don't ever have to keep state of things. But you, you, if you need a new VM, you just come up with a new VM and that's already in the state that, that you need. Uh, we're planning on integrating all of that with Chef, Puppet, and all the tooling, as Avi said, of the DevOps workflow. So that's, a, that's not anymore in the kernel, uh, but, but it's a very important thing, a very important aspect of what we're doing. And it stuck again, but I... So uh, while the next slides loads, you have an application. So what do you need to run on OSV, right? Uh, if you're running a Java application, you need to breathe and you're done. There's nothing else. So uh, that's one of the reasons uh, we're being so focused on the JVM. So it's not that you're, uh, we're not JVM exclusive, uh, but focusing on the JVMs allows us to allow you to run your application without any single change. You can just drop your jar and you're good to go. Uh, because any event, eventual modifications that we may have to make to the JVM are made to the JVM itself. Your application is just fine. Uh, even if you use JNI, and that's why. Because uh, we also try to support the Linux POSIX API. Uh, we cannot support all of it, so some of it is obvious. For example, uh, if you run only a single address space, uh, it's impossible to fork. I mean, threading is fine. We do have uh, pthread create and pthread destroy and pthread, all kinds of pthread callings. Uh, but fork xx something that you cannot do. Uh, and we need position independent code. So at the very least, you need to recompile your application and to instead of generate an elf binary, you generate a shared library. Uh, so there is some effort. It's, that, that's not for free. Uh, that's why we focus on Java, because on, on, if you have a runtime to isolate it from that, then it's a lot easier. Uh, but we don't expect that to be a lot harder either. So please. So the question is, uh, I need to repeat that, sorry. So the question is that we need to make it position independent, sorry. Why? Why? Yeah. Uh, that is because when you run, when you traditionally run an ELF binary, uh, it expects the entry point to be at a definite location. Uh, and it's very, it's fairly easy to guarantee because I've just created the virtual mapping anyway, right? So I can just, that's free. I mean, it, you can just go and load your application in there. But since we only have one virtual mapping, so again, we don't ever switch virtual mappings. We don't ever flush the TLB explicitly. That's why our context switches are so much uh, faster, by the way. So uh, we cannot guarantee that the address in which our program needs to be loaded is available. So, and that's pretty much what position independent code does. Position independent code is code that you can load anywhere. So share libraries because, uh, and, and that's, that's pretty much the reason. Uh, so some applications may not go well with OSV. Uh, we're not too much concerned about that because, again, we are very focused. So if, you're, if OSV cannot run your application, we're fine. So I think the first the restriction is the, the temporary link, or it's just the binary? So the question is if, if either the first restriction, that it must be a single process application, uh, is a temporary restriction. And the answer is no. It's, a, it's part of our architecture. But again, uh, single process, does not mean single processing. I mean, we support threads just fine. We just cannot have different processes. And what does that mean is that uh, we cannot isolate things using memory mappings. So we, when you fork, for example, you generate a completely different memory mapping. And that we cannot do because we only have one address space. Now, that address space can be running as many threads as you want because they share the address space. But process in which you do isolation through memory mappings, that we cannot do. So that's part of the OSV architecture. Uh, that's why you can fork, for example, and that's why it doesn't make any sense to talk about exec. Exec basically just replaces the virtual mapping, which we don't have. Uh, there are other small caveats as well, but uh, they're mostly, I mean, it shouldn't be too hard, but we're not going to run any, everything. That's not our goal. So in terms of better performance, do you have any numbers for a Java workload? Uh, so the question is uh, whether we have any performance number for the Java workloads. I mean, we have some. Uh, we're not necessarily disclosing all of them. I mean, you want to comment on that? Uh, so, so we saw some performance gains with uh, Cassandra. Uh, which is a particularly important workload because it's also a, a NoSQL database. Uh, I don't remember that the numbers are not very high. They're not uh, uh, huge improvements right now, but we've only just started with optimizing um, the JVM and but, doing- But they are better than Linux guest already. Yeah. So I mean, we're already better, but uh, I'm not gonna tell you how much better because it's a b little bit unscientific so far. So like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Hyper-V. Yeah, so you're from Microsoft, right? So the question is uh, whether you have any plans for other hypervisors, and we would like to 
uh, we would like to run everywhere. So as far as hypervisors are concerned, we would like to run everywhere. Uh, there are not that many hypervisors out there. Uh, what is in our plans is uh, we have KVM running very well. We have Zen, that the Zen support is still getting better. Yeah, the drivers. I mean, so you it's, run. It's not just the drivers; it's also the the um, yeah. timekeeping, uh, and but it's really oh, not pr not very difficult to to port a OSV to a hypervisor. It's just a few thousand lines for the, for the drivers and just some glue code for detection. Uh, it's pretty simple. So if you have, if you happen to have a different hypervisor, then send patches, and we'll be happy to merge them. All right. Then. So that, that's basically what we have. Uh, if you have any more questions, now that we're done, I can go around with the microphone so you don't, I don't have to repeat your questions. Uh, we'd like to thank you before you make a question. Uh, don't forget to collect your boxer shorts. And he has the first question. Hold yeah. on. And then, by the way, we are hiring. So if you like what you see, uh, feel free to drop us a line, and uh, uh, we'll be happy. Uh, so I know C++, uh, but don't know Java. Uh, uh, am I still able to contribute something valuable to you? So yes, of course, we have places in all positions in the stack. Uh, if you know C++, you can work on, on the kernel code. If you know Java, you can work on the management stack. And if you know uh, all of them, then you can uh, contribute on the changes to the JVM that we are making uh, that will make uh, Java run Java and JVM-based uh, languages uh, run faster on OSV. So that, So, so the application would be a, a different part. So you, you have, we have APIs that allow you to uh, upload a jar file or an, a WAR file or an ear file or whatever they are called, uh, and they just get uh, deployed uh, on the instance, and then you can start and stop them. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, I think there was a slide with, uh, well, it would be pretty difficult to get to the slide with, uh, we need an operating system just for showing slides. What happens if you have a bug in the JVM or in the application? So the same, uh, the same thing that uh, happens if you have a bug in the application or JVM on a normal operating system, it crashes. Uh, since uh, it's just one application, all of the value is there. You don't lose anything. Um, uh, so with OSV, everything crashes. It just stops, it aborts, and uh, asks for help. Um, so if you have a typical, if you have a multi-user system and the entire system crashes, it's horrible because all of your workloads crashed. But the way we see applications deployed today, it's just one application per server. So if the application crashes, the, the system that remains has no value. All of the value is in the application. So you basically restart the VM. Yeah. As you would restart the application. What about long, long running processes? What, 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 what do you do? That? Do you do live patching and stuff like that? Do you want to do that? No, the, um, the way we see it, uh, that's not what people do on cloud workloads. Um, they run their uh, instance, and if they have a new version, then they just throw it on a new VM, point the load balancer uh, to the new instance. Uh, if it's good, they kill the old one. If not, they kill the new one and try again. Uh, it's a lot more robust than the, the old methods. Uh, is OSV uh, capable of taking advantage of kernel same page merging in Linux? So if you have multiple of these applications running on the same box, they're able to share memory resources? So uh, OSV is completely agnostic to that. If you're running KSM on the host and uh, your applications are similar and it will find uh, similar pages, it's not really an OSV question. It's, it's a KSM question. And yes, KSM will happily merge uh, similar pages uh, from, from different VMs. Um, okay, um, and a follow-up, kind of unrelated. How do you uh, see OSV kind of fitting into uh, like a DevOps workflow, like you had on your slides? Uh, yeah, so we think that the OSV is really a great fit for that because it's so simple. It allows the developer to concentrate on the application instead of the packaging. Uh, you have just the, the, the operating system image, and you can 
push your uh, application on that and then push the whole thing into the cloud. It's really very simple. There, is, there are no configuration files that you need to tune on your image. Uh, I think it, it's a great fit for the DevOps. In, in fact, it was designed, it was inspired by the DevOps workflow. Questions? Um, I'm curious, why did you use ZFS? Um, it appears to me that all this rate code and set pools and all this stuff is also not really necessary in the cloud environment where you usually have enterprise storage backends that can do all the stuff and can do checksumming in this. So why the overhead there? Yes, so, so good question. ZFS is indeed a fairly uh, heavyweight uh, file system and it, I think it contributes most of the code to, to our system. Uh, but it does have features that are good for the cloud. You don't want to spend too, uh, too much time running FSDK or things like that. So a system like ZFS, which has self-healing properties, is good for the cloud. You may not, you may not always trust the infrastructure that's provided by the cloud. They tend to be uh, commodity machines, very cheap, and uh, uh, you might not trust. It's, it's not, not all of them run uh, enterprise class hardware with uh, extreme error, error correction and error checking. Some of them are just disk, local disk attached uh, uh, to the server and you just hope it's correct. So we want to minimize um, uh, the chances of an error creeping, creeping in. Uh, and also we wanted something that is compatible with uh, our license. Uh, so uh, we didn't want to take any uh, uh, GPL uh, file system. Uh, and then DFS became the, the the best content. And there is also something to add to that because you said yourself that uh, in the cloud, most of the time you're not getting to the actual local file system. You, you have some storage in the cloud. So the file system that you have underneath is not terribly important performance wise because most of the critical workloads are not going to reach the file system anyway. So there were no reason for us to go looking for an extremely high performance file system. All, all the manageability thing is a lot more important than that. So the fact that, as I've mentioned, all the checksumming and all the easiness and so on. More questions? Um, so I have two questions. One is, um, do you support ballooning? Um, so right now we don't for have For memory, a, just for memory. Yeah, right now we don't have a balloon driver. Uh, it should be pretty easy to add since we already support the concept of uh, uh, moving memory from the application to the system. So we could also uh, give it to the host. It should be very easy to add. I don't think that balloons are heavily used in the cloud, uh, but it should be an easy fit. Okay. Um, and CPUs, you can't do hot plug right now, I assume, yet. But would that be something that you, you'd be adding? So I could add another CPU to my already running application. Yes, yeah, so you're correct that we don't support hot plug. The code is written in a way uh, that we can support it in the future. If um, there is a, a need, if we see that cloud start to support a hot plug, right now they don't. I don't think even uh, normal enterprise virtualization do hot plug on a common basis, but if you feel there is a need, then uh, a patch would be welcome. Uh, it shouldn't be very hard to add. Again, the system is fairly simple, so it's not completely trivial, but it's a lot simpler uh, than, than the large uh, multi-user systems, and it's fairly easy to add such a feature. All right, I'm actually not sure how much time do you have. How much time do you have? Uh, I guess five minutes anymore, see if you have more questions anymore. One over there. Uh, what is your concept regarding uh, supporting different uh, hypervisors? Uh, are there, is there a version for this hypervisor, version for this hypervisor, version for this hypervisor? Because you just talked about code recognizing. Is it, is it one thing which recognizes on which it's just running or okay. do I compile it for that, for that, for that, for that? And then deeper? it's just a question of how you do it. Yeah. Uh, good question. So we have just one image, and that image knows how to talk to Zen, and knows how to talk to KVM, and will know how to talk to uh, VMware in the future. Um, we, we don't have, since it's just a small number of hypervisors, it's very easy to build, to build in support for all of them. Okay, thank you. Part of your image already? Yes, so there's just, there are just uh, 
six drivers. Uh, what we need the one each for network and block for each of the hypervisors uh, we support. And that might grow in, uh, both in terms of the number of hypervisors and in terms of the different types of drivers. For example, KVM has both Virio Block and Virio SCSI, uh, and we will want to support both. Uh, but still, the number of drivers is on the order of a dozen, so it's very easy to support and to compile into a single image. So there's no issue uh, moving from one hypervisor to the other. You just take the same blob and flop it Yeah, down. no issue. It's just no uh, a few, a few megabytes of uh, binary. It's, it's uh, a very thin system. Uh, all right. Any more questions? Uh, okay, so thank you very much for attending and come here collect your boxer shorts. Thank you.